Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the online seminar series, uh, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So today we have, uh, again, uh, a duetto. So uh, Professor Hawk Baum and uh, Jonathan Bodin is, are presenting together today. Um, they both come from um, UC uh, Berkeley. Um, uh, professor uh, Hochbaum is the Chancellor Professor of uh, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research uh, uh, at the Department of uh, Industrial Engineering. Uh, her expertise is very broad. It ranges from uh, integer programming, discrete optimization, network frog techniques, um, uh, clustering, image segmentation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In uh, 2004, uh, Dorit was awarded an honorary doctorate of science at the University of Copenhagen. In 2005, Dorit was awarded the INFORMS Fellowship title, and in 2014, she was selected as a science fellow. And uh, Jonathan Bodin uh, is working with her on uh, decision trees, and uh, we are going to talk, uh, we are going to uh, listen to them. And as usual, we, we leave the questions uh, at the end, but if you really have a very urgent question, please uh, 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 put it in on the chat and I will read it uh, to them. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for joining today so early in the morning. And the floor is yours, uh, Dorit. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the, this presentation is about a new type of decision tree uh, that we call the max cat decision tree. So, uh, decision trees are widely used in classifications. So, they use as decision trees by themselves in machine learning or as building blocks of random forests. Uh, there is a, a popular implementation of decision tree that is used, it's called CART, and it goes back to uh, Brayman of 1984. We devise here a new type of decision tree that we call the max cut decision tree that modifies the feature space and modifies the standard splitting criterion. The max card decision tree, as you, you'll be seeing today, provides increased accuracy and decreased running time for uh, training decision trees. So what is decision tree? Uh, it is a tree where at each node there is a selection of a feature and respective threshold that is best according to the splitting criterion. And uh, once one selects a feature and this, the threshold is the value of a, assigned to the feature used to partition the observation into two sets, one set or one subset is those that have the feature value less than the threshold and the other have the feature value greater than the threshold. So uh, here you get an abstract um, manifestation of a tree. So at node zero, the, or what's called the root node, we are going to scan all the features and uh, for each one the threshold value and we'll choose one according to the splitting criterion, which is best. And then uh, let's say it's feature I, then all the objects in the data sets that have the value of feature I greater than the threshold go to one set and the others go to another set and here, suppose in one of the set, all of them are class A, the same class, it's a pure set, then this is a leaf of the tree, we fathom it and not continue. The other one, uh, we apply the same criterion again and select among the features with respect to that subset of nodes, uh, of objects, 
uh, the one feature J, so um, and the threshold J that optimizes the splitting criterion, and then again we select feature J uh, greater than the threshold. This is the one selected, and we split it into sets, two set, subsets again. So it's a binary tree that you get. So the splitting criterion is the rule used for selecting one feature and the respective threshold among the features. So uh, the, the commonly used uh, splitting criterion is called Gini impurity, and this is what we call the baseline, what we'll compare to, and this is used by CART. So uh, given a partition to two parts, uh, the, the way the Gini criterion works is that um, the fraction of the, uh, we get two parts, and in each part we compute the fraction of the observation in class C times one minus P of C, and uh, we add it up for all the classes. So in the binary case where we have two classes, there will be two items in this sum, two terms in this sum. And, uh, and we select a threshold for that feature so that the average cardinality weighted, a cardinality weighted average Gini purity of the two sides is minimized. That's the Gini impurity. The, here is an illustration of that. So suppose we have one feature uh, and three objects in the data sets that have the value minus one, two, and three. So whenever we have n items, the number of possible partitions is n minus one because we can place the partition between any two pair, any two pairs. So now we compute that, and the, uh, for this partition, the left side is, has just one item of the green class. So it's one times one minus one, and zero plus zero times one minus zero. So the value is zero for this side of the partition. For this side of the partition, we have one of each type, class A and class B. So we have half times one minus half plus half times one minus half, which is half. So we calculated that for both uh, sides. And now we calculate the weighted average, which is the uh, a third. This one has one out of the total of three objects. So a third times zero. And this side that has the value half has two thirds, so we add two thirds plus half, and that's equal to a third. So we say the Gini impurity value for this feature is a third, for this feature and this threshold. So now let's try the second possible threshold here, and here the calculation is this side has two, and the uh, the value is half, half times one minus half plus half times one minus half. On the right, it is uh, one times one minus one plus zero times one minus zero, which is zero. So we have exactly the same values, and now we calculate the next step. So it's two thirds times a half plus one third times zero, which is one third, which is exactly the same as we had for the previous one. So both both possible partitions have the same value and the Gini impurity will be um, indifferent between them. And it might, it will choose, by the same manner, it will uh, check other features if there are any and choose among them the one to give this uh, least value. Um, let's look at the, new splitting criterion that is proposed here. So we call it max cut. And the reason is that we are going to look at the actual distances between the objects. So 
the way this works is uh, let xij present the value of feature j for, obse uh, for object observation i and y i present the class of observation i and a theta presents a threshold value. So for each threshold value, we are looking at the respective partition and all the same as before, at all the items that are greater than the uh, threshold value and all those less than or equal to the threshold value. And for each pair like that, we consider if they belong to different classes. So if I has a different class than J, then we look at the distances between them. So these are two items, uh, I and J, that end up in different parts of the partition, and we add, we take at the distance between them if uh, they are not in the same class. So we are trying to maximize the differences between the two parts of the partition. So as opposed to the Gini impurity, where only membership in each side of the partition counts, here the actual distance or difference counts. So the same example as we had before, if we use the max cut criterion, uh, let's take the first partition possible. So here we have the partition of the green on the one side and the other green and yellow on the other side. And uh, the value here is we take for the green and the yellow, which are in different classes and different parts. We take the distance between them. This one is value two, this one is valued minus one. So the distance between them is three times one. So the value of this partition is three. The value of the max cut for this partition is one, since we take this green and this yellow, the distance between them is one unit. Uh, so the max cut is going to consider the comparison between the first and the second, and we want to maximize. The first was three, and the second was one. So therefore, uh, sorry, the, the second was one and the first was three. So the first one is selected. So this will be the partition selected. And as you see, though both, both of them are the same in terms of the impurity, each one has uh, one, one side that have a single tone and the other side has one of each. But these two that are different from each other, at least they are close to each other. So they are close in the, and similar in the feature space. Another aspect of the decision tree is how to represent the feature space. Now we are looking at uh, four different feature space representation. And the um, standard one is just to embed the, uh, uh, the, the object in the original feature space. And that's the, the one that is done in CART. Then we are looking instead at what we call pre-PCA. So PCA stands for Principal Component Analysis. So pre-PCA feature representation, we are going to take the PCA, the principal components of the feature spaces, the feature space, at the root node. So before we start, instead of working with the original feature space, we work with the principal components. And we'll take all the components, so we don't drop anything, although this could be a consideration of another variant. But here we take all of them. Then we have what we call local or node PCA feature representation, which is the same idea, but here we calculate at each node of the tree with respect to the given subset of objects, we calculate the PCA. Or the last and the fourth option that we are using is to take local or node means PCA feature representation. 
And here, instead of working with entire set of objects at the given node, we calculate the mean of the not in class. So for each class, we calculate the mean of all the objects that are not in that class. And then we take the, uh, the PCA of the means. So for instance, if we have K classes, we are going to have K means, each one is a vector that um, is the mean of the not in class. And then we are taking the PCA of these K vectors. And in some way, as you'll see, it's really a very successful approach and it captures the, the differences and the similarities in the feature space. Okay, so let's start the, from the first one, uh, the original features presentation. I illustrate it on an example. So let's say the, this is embedded in a two-dimensional space. So we have two features and the green will be class A and the yellow will be class B. So we have uh, two classes and we have these clouds representing the data in the original space. Then uh, the original space uh, coordinates or base, basis give vectors are given here. And now we, um, we are going to split on the original uh, space using the max cut splitting criteria. Notice the, the split is always along a a line or a, or a hyperspace that is orthogonal to one of the, uh, the basis vectors. So let's say we get this split and we get a partition. And now that we got this partition that, sorry, now that we got this partition, uh, we, um, we, we split in each one, but in each one, the feature space is exactly the same. So say it could be a split like that. But now let's do the same example for the pre-PCA. The pre-PCA means that in the original, um, in, in the, so in the root node, we generate the PCA and let's say the PCA gives us these base vectors. So now when we get the split with the max cut, we get something like that, which is orthogonal to one, one of them. And uh, then we split with respect to that and we get in a, we get, these are the same, the same coordinates. So we repeat this again. So um, this is what we could do at depth one of the decision tree. Now uh, with the local node PCA means that each node of the decision tree, we are generating again the PCA. So here at the root node, we get this PCA, we get say this split and now we split it into two and for each one of these we generate a PCA. So these two are going to have different space representation. And now we do the splits and the splits, these two are not necessarily parallel to each other. In the third one, to illustrate the third one, here we take the PCA of the means because there are two two classes here, or binary classes, we are going to get two means. The not in class of A is the mean of everything else, which in this case is class B. So this is the mean of the observations or so objects in class, in class, uh, uh, not in class B, and this is not in class A. So we just get two vectors. And for these two vectors, we find the PCA. We proceed with a, with a, 
getting the split for this space. And now, once we split it, we compute for each one the not in class means. So we have two vectors here and two different vectors in this node. And now again, we calculate the PCA for each one of these and we get that. And then we get uh, what looks like different splits. So altogether, we are going to look at eight algorithmic combinations. So we have for the split criterion, we are going to compare the Gini impurity criterion with the max cut. And in terms of the feature space representation, we are going to use these four types, the original, pre-PCA, local PCA, and local means PCA. And each combination is a, an algorithm in blue that we are going to try. So we are going to try eight algorithms here and illustrate for you the same example, uh, the same example. But just before we go to the example, I want to comment on the complexity of the split. So with the original, the Gini takes dn log n, where d is the dimension or the number of features for each observation n is the number of objects or observations. And so it takes dn log n, but also max cat takes dn log n. So the complexity is the same. The pre-PCA, um, the PCA is done that once at the root node, and it's again the same complexity. The local PCA, before we do the split in each node, we need to do the uh, PCA first, which is n square times p, p in our case will be equal to d, p is the number of vectors, or so principal component that we will choose, but in our um, experiments we used always p equal to d to the original dimension. Um, and it's the same for Max Cut, it dominates everything else, the PCA, and as it will turn out, this takes the most amount of running time. And the local means PCA, because they are only, um, a, 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 they are only K classes and K vectors, it takes D squared times K, but in the complexity analysis everywhere, here we assume that the number of classes is constant or of one. So it's, uh, the, these are the complexities. So these are the same for both Gini and MaxCut. There is no difference here. So here is the illustration of the different eight algorithms. So row one, the top row are all the Gini algorithms and row two are all the max cut. The first column is the original features, the second column is the pre-PCA, the third column is the uh, node feature PCA, and the last column is the node means PCA. So let's see how it progresses at each one of these. So this is the first cut at depth one in each one of these. And this is the second cut uh, at each one of these. So for each one, for each part of the partition, we are going to split it further. So uh, we get partition to four set. Then we do the depth three, then depth four. And finally, this is what it looks like when it, it is complete to full depth. So as you see on the left here, these are horizontal and vertical because they have to be um, parallel to the original feature space. Uh, here, they are all the same direction, which is um, parallel to the to the directions of the 
uh, p the principal components, the one set of principal components, but here um, at each node we get different principal components, and here also we get different principal components, but we, these are of different things. These are of the means, whereas these ones are of the entire set of observation that falls in that node. Uh, I'll switch now to uh, John. Uh, John, please take over and he will show you the details of the comparative study. John, perhaps you have to unmute or Yes, I probably do have to unmute. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> no worries. So, uh, as I uh, said to myself and my cat, it appears, um, the comparative study that we went, we ended up doing a comparative study to see how these different algorithms would perform. To do this, we analyzed over 20,000 synthetic uh, data sets, um, both binary and a multi-class, specifically 10-class data sets. Uh, ranging in size from 100,000 to 100 to 400,000. And then in addition, we ran these algorithms on real world data sets. Um, the implementation of these algorithms, we wanted to make it as fair as possible to make time-based comparisons. So all the algorithms were implemented in the Python programming language and all the algorithms were kept as identical as possible, except for the split and feature subroutines, which by the nature of the difference of the algorithms had to be different but those we tried to keep as close as possible using the same types of NumPy vectorization tricks and the like. So to move on to the results of this experiment, we still first look at the synthetic binary case. And what we have here presented is the accuracy. And so on our y-axis, we have the size of the training data. So this is going to range in at the very bottom um, 100 all the way up to the top at 100,000. It's a logarithmic scale on the number of training observations in the data set. And then all of these were tested their accuracy on another 100,000. The advantages of the synthetic data set is we can generate an arbitrary amount of points to get a good understanding of how well they would perform on out of sample data. And then our X axis is gonna be the dimension of the data or the number of features. And then that's gonna go on a linear scale. And so what we can see from this is, uh, in this case, the darker uh, the color, the more accurate they are. So the guinea node features PCA, the guinea node means PCA, and the max cut node means PCA demonstrate much darker colors than we're getting out of any of the other algorithms, including the baseline cart. We were then able to generate um, statistical significance on whether or not these outperform. And what we see is when we look at the statistical significance of it, we see Guinea node features, these darker colors are gonna be where it's with statistical, signif statistically significant, we can say it's the best performing algorithm. And so the ones then we note of interest are exactly what we noticed from the other graph, the Guinea node features PCA, the max cut node means PCA, and the Guinea node means PCA. And so to better analyze this, we're gonna take a closer look at the guinea node features PCA versus the max cut node means PCA. Uh, this further analysis is indifferent really to the max cut versus the guinea node. And so we're gonna look at the difference between the feature representations. And what we can then, uh, da, da, da. I highlighted the wrong one, but what we see here is that the difference between, what we present here is the difference between the max cut node means PCA versus the Guinea node features PCA accuracy uh, with 
confidence interval. And what we see is there's a specific pattern, and we notice this pattern that occurs throughout, is that the, as the dimensions of the data set go up or the number of features increase, then the node means feature representation consistently moves towards per outperforming and much more significantly outperforming than it was ever outperformed by the node features representation. We then also look now towards how long these actually take, so their running times. And what you can note here is that the max, the node fe means feature representation does produce significant speed up uh, compared to the baseline implementation over here. So these are all relative to the baseline Guinea features implementation. And it's also important to note here that where the node features was outperforming was in this top area over here, which is exactly the same area that's now taking significantly longer computationally. But the, the node means implementations don't suffer from this uh, significantly longer computational time for the higher number of uh, data observations. We then move to trying to analyze how susceptible these algorithms are to noise, um, since that's one of the things that can happen. And so to do this, we look at both informative features and uninformative features. Those that we call informative are gonna be the features that contain information relevant for classification, and the uninformative ones are the ones that do not contain in information relevant for classification, i.e. their noise. This is one of those advantages of using synthetic data sets is that we can directly control which ones are informative and which ones are uninformative. So the results of this analysis uh, show that the node features, the node means, the node are still going to be outperforming, again, darker, better in this case, compared to the baseline implementation. And for these specific ones, we use the training test size of 10,000. So we see that the algorithm does appear to be robust to the addition of some noise features in it. We then move now on to the, the generalization of this to multi-classification. And what we see here is that the scale is again going to be size of training data and dimension of data on X. One thing to note here is that it's not a perfect logarithmic scale. We go from 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, and then 200,000, 300,000, increasing that logarithm much further was computationally infeasible. Uh, so we continue it with 200,000 and 300,000. And what we see here is we get that same pattern with the Guinea node features PCA, the Guinea node means PCA, and the max cut node means PCA outperforming what we have on the other uh, algorithms, including, again, the baseline CART implementation. And the statistical significance on this one shows that with statistical significance, the max cut node means PCA is going to be dominating uh, basically all the other algorithms in this multi-class classification in the higher regimes. And it's undecidable in most other cases. So we then want to though, make the same uh, comparison just to, between the Guinea node features PCA and the max cut node means PCA we did in the binary case. And so that's what we present here. And again, as I mentioned before, we do see this pattern reappearing throughout. And this is another case of it, where as the dimension of the data increases, the use of the node means uh, re uh, feature representation appears to have more and more uh, significant benefits. This is then uh, the other, now we want to turn to the difference between the splitting criterion of either the Guinea node or the max cut to try to understand on that front. And so what we have presented here is a histogram of the max cut node means PCA accuracy, but this is across all of the data sets in the 10 class uh, that we studied. And then we normalize them with respect to the accuracy of the Guinea node means PCA. So anything above one means that the max cut outperformed the node, the max cut outperformed, and anything below one means the Guinea node outperformed. And you'll see here in this gray line, uh, marked a one that we see that the max cut tends to outperform the Guinea uh, representation. Um, we then all now continue to look at this uh, CPU time as we did in the binary case. And we see that once again, the max cut, the node means representation produces significant computational advantages 
over what we have from the baseline cart implementation. And then as to the robustness to noise, the, the, the way to read this one again is going to be on the y-axis, we have the number of the uninformative features, and then on the x-axis, we have the number of informative features. So what we see here is that, again, as the number of informative features or the true dimension of the data increases, the node means PCA is going to continue to dominate more and more significantly. But the other interesting thing to note of here is that the as the uninformative features are increasing, we also see that in this case, the node features doesn't, doesn't survive as robustly, but the node means implementations do survive robustly to the addition of these uninformative features, uh, most likely due to the normalizing, the effect of the, taking the averages. So then after analyzing those on our synthetic data sets, we look at how these will perform in real world data sets. To this end, we present three of the real world data sets that we analyzed, uh, specifically MNIST, CFAIR 10, and CFAIR 100. These are all fairly high dimensional problems, uh, image classification specifically, um, with classes ranging from 10 to 100 and objects uh, seven, about 60,000 or 70,000 and high amounts of features. So the MNIST data set, what we see from this is that the accuracy that we get from the baseline card implementation is 86.9%. Uh, and then we baseline all of these with that being our one, and then everything is gonna be relative to how long it took for the cart implementation to run. And in this case, we see that the max cut node means BCA is going to be the most accurate at 92.4 for a single tree. And then the, the time it took was 9.3% of the time the guinea feature. So we see the significant computational advantages that we saw in the synthetic analysis, as well as the increased accuracy. This continues to see fair 10, where the baseline implementation got 26.2% of the classification correct, where max cut node means PCA our algorithm produced 34.9% accuracy, and also again has a significant computational advantage, taking only 7.5% of the time that the cart implementation did. And then lastly, for CFAIR 100, the accuracy for the CART implementation was 8.3%, which is then compared to our implementation at 12.4%. So that's, again, we have a significant accuracy increase in this case. And then also, as we've seen throughout, the amount of computational time drastically decreased, taking only 6.1% of the computational time. So we want to now see how, the, in the previous analysis we were using, uh, very similar implementations to try to make time-based comparisons as clean as possible. But now we move towards analyzing what this would mean in actual implementations. And so to that end, we implemented Max Cutry, which is a package using Cython. Uh, we then compare the CPU time required to train a decision tree using this Max Cutry package um, compared to the commercial quality uh, scikit-learn implementation, which is one of the standard implementations used in Python. And so what we get from this is that the on the MNIST data set, our algorithm takes 2.91 seconds compared to the second learn, which takes 9.39 seconds, uh, contributing to a 3.2 times speed up. For CFAIR 10, we had 20.65 seconds compared to two minutes and six seconds, uh, accounting for a 6.1 uh, factor increase. And then CFAIR 100, we have 57 seconds uh, to six minutes and 33 seconds, accounting for a 6.8 factor increase. So we see significant computational advantages in, against even commercial grade software. Um, but we move now on to more recent analysis, which is on the, on the random forest, since decision trees are useful in of their self for classification, but a more, powerful implement, a more powerful classifier that's commonly used is the random forest, which is an ensemble method that is created by training multiple decision trees. Each of these uh, trees is trained on their own random subset of K features and a bootstrapping of the training examples. So we do experiments to see how random forest classification algorithms work with the max cut tree as the underlying tree versus how they work with the scikit-learn uh, variant, uh, so that's just your traditional card variant. And then throughout these experiments, we 
uh, report the accuracy as a function of the hyperparameter k. Uh, and then k is going to be the number of features randomly selected for each trait to train on. So this is going to be something that is selected by the uh, data science practitioner um, that is based off of the data set and it's a hyperparameter that can be tuned. So in the case of the synthetic binary data, we present the results for, if you remember back to those boxes at the very end, we report the result for the top right-hand corner. Um, so this is going to be a 50-dimensional data set um, with, in this case, 100,000 training size. And then we also tested on 100,000 uh, test observations. And then all of these use 100 trees. And what we see here is that the green or the top line is going to be the max cut forest, which is going to dominate performance-wise uh, past the about eight uh, number of sampled features. But again, that's a hyperparameter that can be tuned and chosen. So you're able to always operate in this regime over here. And it outperforms the baseline implementation of a random forest. And then for reference, we have uh, the single max cut tree and the single cart tree. Now, so we see that the performance benefits do extend in this case to random forest. And we also now look at the CPU time. In this case, the CPU time becomes a little more interesting based on the fact that the max cut forest actually decreases in computational time required as the number of sampled features increases. Um, this is contrary to what we would intuitively think since each of these splits is now over a larger dimensions and it should be uh, increasing. But what we find is that the size of the tree and the number of splits that have to be made drastically decreases as the number of the sampled features is increasing, attributing to the decrease in the running time, where the uh, traditional baseline card implementation does what we would expect with its computational time increasing as it goes. But what is important to note is, again, that was a hyperparameter we could choose. So when we choose the uh, best hyperparameter for both of these, which are marked here now with an X, what we see is in that case, uh, we do have a computational advantage to using the max cut uh, forestry as well as the accuracy benefits that we saw over there. So we then continue this analysis to the case of the 10 classes, the generalization to multi-class. And again, we see that the max cut forest does still provide the highest performance benefits compared to the CART baseline implementation and then the single tree implementations. And in this case, we then will also see the exact same pattern for the CPU time, except in this case, the we still see the decreasing CPU time for the max cut force and the increasing uh, for the cart. In this case, the comparison becomes less clearly in max cuts force on a CPU basis. But what we can then see is when we look at the uh, maximum uh, achieved uh, accuracy, for the hyperparameters, it is fairly close with cart forest benefiting. But if we take a quick peek all the way back at here, even at the very lowest level of the, the highest number of sampled features for the max cut forest, we are outperforming even at the best for the cart forest. And so at that point, you can see that that is going to be this marker over here at the very end. So if accuracy wasn't the utmost importance, you can still beat the cart forest with comparable running time. So in conclusion, what we see is that the max cut decision tree uses two modifications, the CART methodology for constructing classification decision trees. It first off uses the local mean PCA's representation for the feature space, and then the max cut criterion for determining optimal splits. Together, we see these modifications result in significant improvements, both in accuracy and a significant decrease in computational time. Uh, and then initial experimentation that we have done demonstrates that extending the max cut tree to random forests are likely to result in similar improvements. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, both of you. It has been uh, a pleasure to, to see your presentation. I believe that we already have questions. Is, is that the case, uh, Itamar? Um, I see a hand raise, Itamar. Um, you hear me now? 
Yes, we can hear you. So okay. if you uh, pose your question. No, I can say it in simple words. Uh, very naively, a pre-processing with SVM pre-calculations pre may ease and uh, make more efficient the whole thing, no? Support vector machines, classification, uh, clustering before the classification. Thank you for your question. Yes, uh, I'm not sure what you are suggesting. We are looking here. We are looking here at decision trees. Uh, no, there is no comparison in this study made with the vector machine. I'm not sure what you are suggesting. Yeah, I, I could be wrong, that's why I say very naively. But even a tree, decision tree, can be classified for different branches' importance or relevance. That, that sounds like a good idea, but uh, at this study, we don't know how something like that would have performed. This is something that might be worthwhile studying. Um, yeah, you are focused, I understand. Of, yeah, we are focused here only on decision tree because uh, in general, random forest, that's a very kind of uh, loose statement. But uh, in general, random forest as a machine learning technique it is a very effective machine learning technique that is hard to beat. Um, and uh, even compared to neural networks that uh, require a lot of training. Uh, so uh, the purpose here was only to focus on decision trees and under the technique. Okay. Thank you, Itama. Thank you very much. We have, we have another question. Uh, Jorge, would you like to state the question? Otherwise, I can read it from the chat. Okay. Um, okay, so I will read it. So, uh, thanks for your talk. This is Jorge Martin from UNED University. How does the max cut handle uh, categorical or discrete predictors, like, for example, zip codes? Thank you, Jorge. Uh, I can answer Wait. to that. Uh, I can answer to that one. The way we did it in some of the analysis that we looked at um, was we used one hot encoding to embed it using zero ones and then just treated those as continuous values. And we still had performance benefits. Thank you very much. Is there any other question from the audience? So um, I had a question. Uh, so, so, so you you also handle uh, uh, random forest uh, implementation with your uh, methodology, and because your methodology is already quite uh, strong for a single tree, have you observed uh, um, that actually you can build uh, a random forest with fewer uh, trees? Hey John, maybe you want to comment on that? Uh, I can comment on that. Um, what we do see is uh, it does, uh, again, uh, pick up fairly rapidly, as you mentioned, based off of the benefits. Um, I didn't do too, too much analysis, so I can't uh, too heavily concretely comment on it. But from what I do remember of just looking through the data, um, it, it does um, pick up steam faster, 
but then it still takes a while to actually converge to not getting any benefit for, from adding more trees to it. Thank you. Um, is there any other question from the audience? The, I have another question. So, so because you have this distance uh, between uh, features, um, could you uh, could it, could it help uh, to define a kind of a similarity, uh, say between uh, yeah between these uh, features that you are handling, so that you can reduce uh, the complexity of your tree. Um, I'm not sure what will reduce the complexity, but because one idea that is central is the use of PCA, uh, we are not using PCA to reduce the dimension, but we can, for instance, just take the four or five leading principal components and therefore we'll have to test only five combinations of features instead of the original could be a million features. So in a way the PCA I think is one example of capturing what you are suggesting, the importance of the features. So here, but it's not an important exactly an importance is the importance of some linear combination of the features. Actually a future work that we are beginning now is to use the max cut decision tree uh, in with the variance of the feature space representation to derive a uh, feature importance and uh, which we plan to use in other contexts. So the car decision tree, there are several procedures to derive feature importance based on that. And we are going to see whether feature importance based on this could be useful and helpful. Also, I want to add that this is the idea of the means uh, of not in class to do the PCA on this as representation of the entire class uh, object of the same class um, is uh, very powerful and uh, we are not, we don't have theoretical justification for it, but we think that it captures the differences between each one and the complement classes in a way that others cannot, and it has the advantage of reducing the dimension in a fantastic way. I mean, we end up only for K classes, only with K means to work with them so that it makes it very easy. So, uh, yeah, I did, at this point, running time uh, is not an issue. And there are trade-offs. So, for instance, uh, when we increase the number of features in the random forest, the max cut random forest works uh, works faster and gives better accuracy. And we think that this is because it tends to uh, fat on the tree much earlier and have fewer nodes in the tree. Um, we'll have to invest some research to figure out whether there is a theoretical result there or this is something that uh, just happens in practice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, I think we are coming to uh, the end of uh, today's talk. We are again grateful that uh, you both uh, joined with such an interesting and these very competitive uh, computational results. Um, just for the audience, um, I would like to say that uh, there is one more seminar coming uh, 
um, it will be on June 7 and um, after that we are not going to stop so we decided to have a second season and we will start after the summer and you can see already that we have um, gather uh, some uh, colleagues uh, to um, agree on giving a seminar. So we will start with Coralia Cartis, continue with Tias Gans, uh, Leo Liberti, Andrea Lodi, Christine Pagel, and uh, Thibaut Vidal. Um, I have placed them on alphabetical order, so, but actually Coralia is the one that will uh, start season two. So I, quite happy um, that to see so many of you coming and so many of you uh, listening to our uh, videos on YouTube and um, yes uh, thank you for your support uh, it's because of you that we decided to continue um, uh, our um, second season thank you all and thank you Dorit for coming today and thank you for uh, um, John to join uh, today too Bye-bye, everybody. See you on June Bye, 7th. Thank, thank yeah, you, Doreen. Thank you. It was a pleasure to see you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you, John. I didn't meet you before, but it was uh, great to see you and your results. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. He actually...